Uh, thank you, Jim. This, uh, for California and how big it is in its diversity, this topic is so complex that I'm just going to try to do five to seven minutes of roughly declarative sentences about information and hope that we can get to the places that you really want to go in the questions and the discussion. Because I think it's fair to start with just what does climate change mean to California? There are two particular studies. Uh, one last year from the Stanford Woods Institute that plotted uh, temperatures and historic climate for California and really showed that in the last decade, roughly, we have had the warmest and driest temperatures and climate in modern recorded history in California. And the summary of that particular study was that California has moved from one climate to another climate that is warmer and drier, and yet all the infrastructure decisions and all the public policy assumptions were based on the climate that we have moved out of. And so we have to figure out how to think differently. Secondly, out of the University of California at Merced, there has been uh, extensive work done on the history of fire in California. And basically, it mirrors on the fire level, the Stanford study, a majority of the biggest, most destructive fires in California history have just happened in roughly the last decade. And we're moving into a different period of fire behavior in California. And with both of these, it obviously has a big impact on species and uh, uh, what just lives in California. If you look at what we are doing on climate change, which gets to species, but what we're doing, the governor has set out five different goals. He calls them five pillars. And four of them are basically established goals and just moving them to the next level. We have a goal of by 2020 being to 33% renewable energy in our portfolio. We're on schedule for that. And the next goal is 50% by 2030. Uh, there's a goal to double the efficiency in buildings. California, because of efficiency standards that were enacted when Governor Brown was governor the first time, has essentially had per capita energy usage that has been close to the same over 40 years as we get efficiency. He is sort of setting a goal to take that to the next level. Uh, on short-lived climate pollutants, uh, he really is trying to work uh, on a goal with that. When I was in the legislature 10 years ago, we adopted what is known as AB 32, uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act, which said that California will, in 2020, be at where our level of greenhouse gas emissions were in 1990, which is a roughly 15% lowering of greenhouse gas emissions. We are on target to meet that. And he is setting a goal that's even further out for doing that. Then there is uh, uh, the goal of cutting petroleum use because California did uh, tailpipe standards in 2002 that went all the way through the courts that now have been mirrored by the federal government. Uh, a per capita mileage gas consumption is going down. Uh, this is the one that's been really thorny. He could not get it through the legislature last year. And then the fifth one is natural lands. It is really uh, uh, the ballywick that, that I am in and how do we lower greenhouse gas emissions. And that really covers fire. Uh, it covers uh, ag land protection, wetlands restoration, whole hosts of issues. So then what are the challenges? And the challenges are that the fires have been so big, the rim fire, uh, which happened in 2013, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, the carbon from that fire was equal to the emissions of 2.3 million cars in California in a year. So the question is, is can we do work on fire prevention that is not just public safety, not just habitat, but at the same time as greenhouse gas capture or less emissions. The, as part of AB 32, the state enacted a cap and trade program. So basically, if people are going to emit over their level, 
it's capped at the level and they buy credits for the parts that they can't mitigate, that goes into a fund. It is in the current year, $3 billion. And then it is used on programs to lower emissions. We as a resources agency have received money for wetlands restoration, for ag land protection, for fuels prevention in fire. And then also in the drought, we have had tree mortality that is unprecedented. The low range estimate of dead trees in the Sierra is 29 million. And so as a fire prevention, as a place for, for bark beetles and other things and invasives, uh, we have a challenge. We have $150 million in the governor's budget of cap and trade money to deal with biomass uh, uh, as a feedstock coming from the dead trees, different things. We, we have a whole thing there to deal with. On water, uh, together with our federal partners, we provide water in a normal year, 5 million acre feet, to 25 million Californians through the uh, water districts that serve them and to 3 million acres of irrigated agriculture. And the problem we have there, which is an endangered species problem, is the relation of water to fish. And it is also a climate change problem because our water bank is the Sierra snowpack. Last year was so unprecedented. When the governor sat at their summer meeting in Tahoe and faced the Sierra across the lake, there was no snow. In, in the summer, we were at 0% of normal for snowpack in the Sierra, just plainly and simply unprecedented. And the studies show, since that is the water source for the 3 million acres of irrigated agriculture and the 25 million uh, Californians that depend on it, that the snowpack under climate change could reduce by as much as 50% by the end of the century. And since it flows out of the Sierra into the streams and reservoirs and rivers, into the delta where the Sacramento and San Joaquin and other rivers join and into the San Francisco Bay. If we don't have adequate flows to that delta, it's not healthy for fish. And it also doesn't keep the salt in the San Francisco Bay, it encroaches. And so we have as a climate change action with Lake Shasta Reservoir, which fortunately is at normal right now for the first time in five years. We have releases that come of cold water from that, that go into the system, that help the fish, that meet our ESA requirements, and uh, also keep the salt in the bay. Uh, we also have a massive flood issue in California, which seems silly after four years drought, but the water that flows in the Sacramento Valley has been so heavy. In 1862, it crossed 30 miles across the valley. You could not see the other side of where the water was when that happens. So an elaborate system was built. Sacramento is number two behind New Orleans in flood risk because of the levees that at certain times when there are high flows allows water to be diverted through weirs in a large bypass around Sacramento into the headwaters of the San Francisco Bay. That traditionally is done once every eight years. It's manual. It's done on readings. Water is released into the flood bypass. We are working with the local governments there to lower the triggers for the a bypass, to have it flood twice as often, to be used as a fish uh, uh, habitat area so more water moves through and more marshy conditions to create fish and meet our requirements. At the same time, when the Delta was armored uh, over the last hundred years and levees were built around these so-called islands so they could be farmed and their subsidence, water just goes straight through it really hurts the ability for fish habitat. We are committed to restoring acres of fish habitat. In this budget, we have money for 6,700 acres of fish habitat restoration that's marshy in the Bay Area. First time in the 50 years since the water project was built, we will be bringing back fish habitat to help deal with it. This has been so explosive that Fox News, one of my favorite network channels, has uh, uh, come to the area and they hold a fish and they say, this is farms versus fish. This little fish is causing all this water to keep it from going to farms, but it's really the canary in the coal mine, uh, uh, regardless of that one fish, whether it's salt, whether it's other things, restoring it is really central to having an entire system uh, that operates. And so 
and we have also uh, money that's going for salmon restoration. Uh, I talked about the Klamath yesterday, uh, and I've exhausted my time. And so you can just imagine sort of the complexity of dealing with all this, and I haven't even gotten to the climate change and the wildlife corridors that we need to do for the connectivity and some of the other issues we have. Uh, but we feel like we are at ground zero since we are number two to Hawaii in biodiversity and an endangered species in, in a state of 39 million now where we are trying uh, to deal with this and trying to track with climate change and our species and what might be required as well by the ESA. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Bruce, you want to proceed? It's already loaded. It's beautiful. Thanks. I have PowerPoint again. Uh, and again, thank you for having Alaska here. We really appreciate being here. Uh, we're going to give you our uh, perspective on climate change and the ESA. Uh, Alaska has the uh, we're, we're the lead in climate change based listings. We've, we're way out in front of everybody. I think it's safe to say that. And uh, we're going to use this opportunity to point out several problems with climate change based listings that really I think that uh, all states need to be aware of and we need to get ahead of uh, uh, only to deal with these complicated issues. We're, we're also lead because we're an Arctic state and climate change is really amplified in the, in the Arctic. Things are happening much faster up in the Arctic than in, although it sounds like they're happening pretty fast in California too. Um, if you look at the rate of anomalies as a function of latitude, the farther north you get, you get uh, an amazing jump in the terms of temperature analogies. And these are, this results in rapid changes in, in, in impacts. Uh, the state focuses on adaptation to deal with these impacts. And you know, when you look at climate change in that sort of rapid fashion, you think about things like public safety, uh, infrastructure, you know, towns are gonna go away soon. They're considering moving several small villages um, food security is a problem throughout Alaska. Climate change is really up the ante on the food security issues. And then, of course, somewhere down the list of issues, you get to wildlife. We have, uh, again, quite a few petitions. These are all in various states, but, uh, um, you know, everything from coral to uh, yellow cedar. And, of course, the marine mammals are, play a big role. And now northern bog lemming. The polar bear is an interesting case because it's it's relatively mature. Uh, there actually is there's a draft recovery plan. Uh, it's the first climate change listing recovery plan. Uh, if you look at the bottom bit there, greenhouse gases were identified as the only significant threat. Harvest by uh, Native Alaskans and industry were not as were you know tertiary kinds of issues, but the primary threat is greenhouse gases. The problem that presents is that that you know you really can't do meaningful conservation for a worldwide problem on a local level, and most of the effects, most of meaningful conservation is going to happen locally. Um, the critical habitat is uh, the size of California; it's very large, and it includes, as I mentioned yesterday, very low habitat values. And this is a problem because it really degrades the designation of critical habitat and what can be done in terms of meaningful conservation. Um, I'm going from the bottom to the top here just to shake it up a little bit. ESA is the wrong tool for dealing with emissions. And this is pretty widely recognized um, when you look at practical terms. Uh, some people still think it, it uh, you know, brings a lot of attention to the issue, and it certainly does. And that's probably the one, the one benefit. But in terms of um, actual practical application, there's not too much that can be accomplished. The polar bear was uh, listed in 2008 and remains so. Ring seals and bearded seals, uh, these were uh, pre-decline listings. The, uh, the projected declines are not out till, they're not projected, the populations are not even project, projected to decline until the year 20,090. So that means that everything about this list, these listings has to be modeled. And there's a huge amount of, of uncertainty, a lot of assumptions. Everybody assumes that, well, the, the, the assumptions are, and the, 
the uncertainty is around just the loss of sea ice. But that's not true. In fact, many of the really important assumptions are how these animals, these species will respond because we don't have any empirical data on it other than they're still here after other cycles. So this is something that we really struggle with in terms of, of these petitions and meaningful conservation. The, uh, the ring seal critical habitat, as I showed in the slide yesterday, is another huge area. Uh, and then you get to the question of what would be the biological recovery goal when the species are healthy and abundant. That's a real problem in terms of coming up with a recovery plan. So let's look back a little more at the, the ESA as a tool for regulating global emissions. You know, multiple administrations agree that the ESA should not be used to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we can't really regulate activities abroad with this. And the link between individual facilities and direct harm to animals is not discernible. This is a, this is a major practical point. Um, and then the, uh, the, the services are not equipped to regulate emissions and probably aren't the right entities to do so. So in some senses, we have to look at, are the, are the changes worth it? Are these listings worth it for these species? Can't adjust climate change, so the protections focus on resilience of the species. There's little conservation benefit, uh, especially for the Marine Mammal Protection Act species. And this was touched on a little bit yesterday uh, by Mr. Kindred. You know, there's a higher bar uh, for these species on the Marine Mammal Protection Act than there is under ESA, which is simply persistence. So even if you get to a point where you're not, um, uh, the, the act is no longer or is not applicable, uh, you still have this Marine Mammal Protection Act, which has a higher standard for these species, and, and that's in play all the time. So what's the benefit of this lower uh, bar when you already have an act in place? As I mentioned earlier, listings do, in fact, increase public awareness about a global problem. Uh, increased regulations on those that are already most affected by climate change is what we're looking at in the, in the Arctic regions especially. You know, these people have erosion going along with more storms and sea levels that haven't occurred in the past, and they're about to lose their village, and then people want to put restrictions on their harvest of uh, food supply. So the listing process is expensive, and conservation dollars are limited. This is how we're spending money, and these are particularly ripe for litigation because it's uh, these climate change-based listings are all new. The foreseeable future, making predictions is easy. Getting them right is pretty difficult. And then there's a catch-22 about the foreseeable future. You know, models require assumptions about the unknown, and measuring the uncertainty of multiple unknowns is difficult, especially over long time horizons. So one particular issue that I hit on yesterday and will hit again today is this broad critical habitat designations. They, you know, south of, if you see where the Seward Peninsula is kind of that big peninsula that sticks out towards uh, Russia there in the middle, below that is really not polar bear habitat. Occasionally one will stray down there and, and uh, hopefully gets back home. But uh, that's a large, huge area there that's designated as critical habitat. And you would never go there to try and see a polar bear, never. And that, that lumping of high and low quality habitat provides lower conservation value to all the, the efforts. And there's, of course, increased uh, regulatory uncertainty. When everything is critical, nothing is critical. So the, another big issue is recovery planning. It's, uh, it's very difficult to, to write a recovery plan for something that hasn't even declined yet. The, uh, the primary threat in this case is not really included. The recovery goals are very lofty. Implementation of recovery is difficult, and uh, it's focused on resilience rather than, than uh, of the species. And there's really no additive conservation benefit. So these, these listings are partic particularly difficult, other than raising awareness. You know, for some of these species, it, it doesn't really make much sense. So these are the states of recommendations. We think that the, the issues and the benefits of climate change, we need to be assessed under the ESA. We really need to look at this as, is this the right tool? Is there some better, better way to do this? Because we're using our conservation dollars for this. Consider how to address currently healthy populations at risk of climate change impacts. I think there needs to be a different paradigm for these. 
and and we really need to have that discussion specifically i can't can't say my model is not predictive enough to say whether other states will eventually see numerous climate change listings but they're particularly particularly vulnerable uh, to these because of the uncertainty that's associated with it. And uncertainty requires conservative measure on the parts of the agencies. Uh, lastly, we'd like to provide a clear definition of foreseeable future that includes uncertainty and uh, make climate change list listings a lower priority because of the low conservation benefit. So thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Eric? Thank you. Yeah, I'm Eric Gardner with Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and Br Bruce, you did a lot of my work for me there. I think I'm going to reinforce some of the uh, comments and concerns that uh, Alaska brought forward, but I also might try to uh, break it down to a, just kind of a, a foundational uh, point of the conversation, at least the way I see things. Um, but first off, I wanted to say that I, I feel really fortunate to represent the state of Washington, you know, not D.C., but the state. We have a governor that recognizes that climate change is real and is actively seeking ways to address it. And that leadership is really appreciated and allows my agency uh, to, to tackle the issue and address it where we can. And we have certainly uh, made attempts to do so in addition to the governor's work on uh, energy and carbon trade objectives. Uh, my agency has a, a state climate response strategy that was approved in 2012. And we just revised our state wildlife action plan and we identified key climate factors for um, all of our species of greatest conservation need. And we identified uh, 10 mammals, two birds, three amphibians, 16 fish, and four invertebrates with moderate to high or high vulnerability to climate change. And we are already seeing uh, impacts of climate change in our state. Uh, we're seeing shifts in species ranges, uh, challenges for our salmon related to water temperatures, the loss of suitable habitat for alpine species. Last year, our snowpack was about 0% as well and, uh, in our ranges. And we had one of the largest complex fires we've had in the state, over 300,000 acres burned. And that followed a complex fire the year before that that was on a similar level. Um, so I say all that to, you know, hopefully convince you that, that uh, you know, Washington gets it with understand that climate change is happening and that there's some real impacts and they need to be addressed somehow. Um, but even with that stage being set, there are challenges uh, in dealing with the Endangered Species Act and climate change. And similar to Bruce's discussion, I'll bring up the term uncertainty, but for, for me it kind of is a little different. For me, I think it's some of the greatest harm that, you know, the climate change um, uh, I, I guess discussion has brought in, into into the, the discussion is the use of that term uh, vulner or, uh, uncertainty because it's easy to kind of use it as a scapegoat to not address issues. You can say, well, it's uncertain, so we don't know what that means. And I think it's kind of unfortunate that we get hung up on the uncertainty because that uncertainty is really more towards magnitude, timing, um, how animals may respond is a good addition, Bruce. Um, and how to pick and select downscaled models to use in site-specific management decisions. There's some, there is uncertainty there, but there's not so much uncertainty that changes are coming. Um, and I think all too often we, we fall back on that um, and, and escape or avoid the, the tougher discussion. But that leads me to the Endangered Species Act and, and uh, back similar to what we just heard from, from Bruce. Um, I want to focus a little bit on best available science and the foreseeable future. Um, and I'm going to hopefully not offend any of you by kind of giving my basic summary of a couple of definitions in the Endangered Species Act. I think everybody in the room already knows this, but it helps me put things into perspective if I remind myself that an endangered species is one that's in danger of extinction throughout all or significant portion of its range. And to me, that means that there's some pretty strong evidence that that bad things are happening and the population is already suffering and time is of the essence. Um, and then we have threatened as a, a, another listing outcome and that's where things get a little bit more murky, at least for me. That's where a species is likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. Now again, I know all of you know that and I don't mean to uh, imply anything other than that, but for me uh, that grounds the conversation because I'm stressing it because when you Think about climate change. That's really the realm that we're in, especially when you're thinking about modeling, trying to tell us what will happen in the future. 
and perhaps in instances where the animals are currently doing well. Um, so when I think of climate change, I think about that foreseeable future and what should the appropriate role be uh, for that modeling and when should it take effect. So I ask questions like, what should foreseeable future really mean? Um, where do we draw the line on, say, threatened designations? Should it imply that populations are already declining or showing that they're suffering some problems from climate change? Or should it allow for protections, um, even if populations are currently healthy? If they are healthy, will the act be able to address carbon emissions? Um, or is something else needed for that? And I think I won't spend much time on that since, since Bruce did. Um, if it cannot address climate change, perhaps a listing will address other significant threats, thus making a species more resilient to climate change. So there's some value there, but when should that be enacted? Um, so for me, um, if it can address resiliency, then perhaps uh, a listing is, is warranted, but I struggle with that when the population is healthy. And I personally very, you know, really struggle with uh, a designation when you can look at a population um, and it is healthy and the listing isn't really going to address any tangible threats, no positive outcome that you couldn't achieve without federal uh, intervention. So is that federal, federal intervention and designation really going to cause new things to occur for that species that couldn't happen without it? Um, you know, I've spent about 15 years, uh, 25 plus in wildlife conservation, about 15 uh, in non-game or wildlife diversity programs, and I care very much about the species that we're talking about. Um, and kind of is true with, with anything with the word conservation in it. I think we've all been trained to err on the side of caution. And I've made that a practice uh, for how I manage uh, in my career in many ways. Um, but there's a danger to doing that, especially when um, society perhaps is not seeing the potential threat, doesn't quite understand yet, and is looking around and seeing healthy populations, in some cases of animals, and trying to envision a threat into the future. Um, and so from my point of view, one cost in the transition, say from a state listed or a state species to a federally listed species is that transition in uh, authority. It can reduce management flexibility. Um, it adds species to a, a quickly growing list that are competing for a, a similar, if not shrinking pot of funds in many cases. Um, and I think more importantly, one of my final points is I, I, I worry that it erodes the public support for the Endangered Species Act in general. And we've seen a lot of efforts to change the act. This form is, in fact, the result of some of that uh, that concern for some of the issues with the Endangered Species Act. And I, I uh, respect the tool, the act. I think we need it. I've benefited and, and worked closely with, with species in recovery, like ferret and condor. And I'd hate to lose the power and the influence of the Endangered Species Act. And I worry a lot about the erosion of its authority um, because of lack of social or political support. So I guess in closing, my, my comments is, or my comment is that uh, for that reason, I think that you know priorities for listing should be species for which the listing will result in in recovery planning, actions that can be taken to address specific threats, um, and and that's where our efforts should go, uh, unless there's a really strong case that climate change is one of the driving factors and and just absolutely can be addressed or that, that we have data that the, the population in question is going to diminish. Um, and I don't intend to go into it in any great detail right now, um, I think I'm out of time, but uh, there was a recent decision by the service to not list Wolverine and it was overturned by a court and I'm not picking sides on that at all, but I encourage everybody to look at that because it is really a case study for uh, climate change and how it should be brought into the question for, for listing. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Margaret? <coughs> not sure. Is this good? OK. I'm just going to sit here. I have a PowerPoint also, but um, do I have to do anything to get it going? or Just turn it upside down. Wait, what do you mean? Turn it around 360 degrees. Point the other end at the. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Oh, wait. <clears throat> oh, OK. Sorry. I thought it, someone had to load it. Sorry. OK. Um, so I'm Maggie Sport Kohler. I'm the state botanist for the Department of Land and Natural Resources. So I work for Suzanne Case. Um, and um, I'm going to be speaking primarily about 
plants in Hawaii because that's what I'm most familiar with. But I just want to acknowledge that I don't think there are any native organisms in Hawaii that aren't going to be impacted or already being impacted by climate change. We've got marine species, our native birds, of course, and invertebrates. Um, and our native tree snails are a big group that are going to be um, seeing some major impacts from climate change. So I just want to acknowledge that and, and maybe we can get into those topics later in the discussion. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the flora and um, get you all on the same page um, with some of the some of the um, statistics about Hawaii's flora. And um, so we have a very rare flora. There are about 1,400 native plant species in Hawaii, and 449 of those are federally listed as threatened or endangered. Um, so that's a very large number of, endanger of listed species that we're working with. And the, and the state also it, it manages those under our own um, in, you know, endangered species listings. And our, our list mirrors the federal list, so it's the same number for the state. Um, there are 238 species that are managed by the Plant Extinction Prevention Program. So we call that the PEP program, and we call those PEP species. And those species have fewer than 50 individuals remaining in the wild. So we have 238 species for which there are fewer than 50 individuals remaining. And I just think that's kind of a big deal. And it's something that, you know, as doing plant conservation in Hawaii, um, we're constantly coming back to those species and trying to look for solutions to work on the to work on recovery for those species. Um, and I also want to mention that that PEP program is largely funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service and then also by those Section 6 funds that the state has allocated. A large chunk of our state Section 6 funding goes towards that PEP program. Okay, so our flora is extremely vulnerable. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. So Hawaii, as you know, is a, it's a series of high volcanic islands and with those high volcanic islands, it has created a scenario um, with narrow endemism because we have such extreme um, environmental and climate gradients in Hawaii. We, you know, our, our range goes from sea level all the way up to 14,000 feet in elevation. And within that range, we have, you know, quite a range of rainfall, humidity, temperature gradients. There are many different types of habitats. Um, we have basically every type of, um, you know, biozone. It, known in the world, minus just a couple. Um, so there are a lot of different types of habitats, um, which gives rise to a lot of different types of species that are only found in Hawaii. Um, so, and we've also looked at some climate modeling scenarios and many of our native plant species don't fare well under these scenarios, under the best models that we have right now. Uh, so there are many species that their range doesn't have very much overlap. Their current um, suitable habitat doesn't have very much overlap with the future predicted suitable habitat. And there are over 50 species that uh, one study um, found that there are about 50, over 50 species that had, were considered wink out species. So they had no suitable habitat under the future climate change predictions in Hawaii. So these are definitely serious topics and they're coming up more and more often in the plant conservation community here. Um, another couple topics that come up often are the increase of possible stochastic events. So definitely um, more storm, large storms, hurricanes, those are threats that we, that we uh, worry about in Hawaii. And then also drought related fires. We've seen a lot of fires. Um, it might be a little bit hard necessarily to tie those to climate change at this point, but some people are definitely making that connection already. And uh, we also have you know, more people too. So that's another reason that we're having more fires. But you know, we, the areas are very dry and they seem to be becoming more dry. So this is an important thing to look at. So what actions are we, are we using? <laughs> are we starting to look for? Um, we wanna look at climate change to provide guidance for management. And I feel like with the plants, we've been doing that in some ways for a while already, or at least some of the management actions that we've been using will be effective in light of climate change. And one of the big ones is our ex situ conservation for rare plants. So we have a pretty robust um, program across the state where we're making collections of seeds, we're making propagule collections, and we're storing them safely in seed banks or in living collections that then could eventually be propagated and outplanted in a, maybe a different location than what the native range is, or just safeguarding that genetic diversity for those species for a future time and place that's appropriate and safe for those species. It's, you know, that's Those are some of the things that we're already doing a lot of, and I feel good about that, and we're ramping that up even more. Um, so, And that's another one that's largely funded by Section 6 funds. 
So a lot of the, the state funding goes towards some rare plant facilities that we have on four of our main islands, as well as some seed banking um, areas. So um, another thing to think about is incorporating these management actions um, into recovery planning. And I think that's already being done at the federal level is starting to be done more and more. It's basically looking at management actions that will work in light of climate change and thinking outside the box is really important, I think, and getting a little bit more comfortable with maybe using some management methods that weren't as or a little more controversial, like uh, translocations. I mean, in Hawaii, we have so many very narrowly endemic species that you know maybe just slightly different from a species on another ridge, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about should we mix them um, to get more genetic diversity or just so that we can have that other species on that other ridge where it used to exist, you know, the other variety that was very similar. And there's a lot of conflicting uh, opinions about that, but we might want to get more comfortable with doing that if it means that we can keep some of our species um, from going extinct. And um, yeah, in terms of state recovery planning, so we are already making efforts to do that more, incorporating climate change. We're working with the Fish and Wildlife Service on this, looking at habitat suitability models for our current species, and we're doing this on a species by species basis. And then looking at um, you know using climate modeling to see what the suitable habitat will be in the future. And then we're creating some overlays on our current management units um, to prior prioritize where we're doing management and what kind of management. So I think we're making some pretty good efforts to incorporate climate change um, uh, thinking in our management planning, and but we can always be doing more. And um, I do think that creative thinking is really important. And I have a few examples. It was it, really hard to choose uh, which species to showcase here, but I wanted to just show a few. So this is a native mint species, Haplostachys haplostachia. It's endemic to, or it uh, occurs only on Hawaii Island now, it used to be on a couple other islands, but it's the only extant species left in an endemic genus. So there used to be uh, five species in this genus, and now there is only this one. And um, this photo I snapped in a, in a large field, there's a small population that and they're all living in fountain grass like this. So this is really scary when you're looking at a really rare species um, that's basically just hanging on in a sea of fountain grass, which is very fire prone. Uh, another example, this is a native member of the carnation family, Shadea adamantis. And I chose this one because this species is endemic to Diamond Head Crater. And I know that most of you are familiar with Diamond Head Crater. And we have a couple of different species that are only found on Diamond Head Crater. And this one is a PEP species. So there are fewer than 50 wild individuals left. And this, this site is very vulnerable because it's low elevation. It has a lot of weeds. It's very dry most of the year. And there's a lot of human um, activity around this area. And there was actually a fire here just two weeks ago on this crater. And I spoke with our Oahu Plant Extinction Prevention um, Coordinator about this. And I asked her if any of the plants got touched because I saw where the fire was and I know that it was near where the plants are. And she said it came within inches of killing a couple wild plants, but it didn't, they were spared this time. So that was a little bit hopeful, but it's very scary, these things that come up. And then one last example, a native lobelioid, Traumatolobelia kaali. So this one is not yet listed um, and you know may not need to be right now or anytime soon, but it is a single island endemic. The numbers are you know, not, you know, there aren't that many of them. Uh, it occurs in a fairly narrow uh, elevation band of about 3,800 to 4,000 feet elevation. And this is the highest point on the island of Oahu where this plant occurs. So, you know, people talk about it, under climate change conditions, you might see plants needing to migrate up in higher elevation. Well, this is an example, and there are many plant species that kind of fall into this category. They don't have anywhere to migrate to. They're already at the top of the mountain. <laughs> so, and we have set quite a few species like that on Oahu because they occur in those high elevation wet forest scenarios. So just wanted to give you a little background about what we're dealing with the plant conservation and, and thinking about climate change in Hawaii. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Um, I'd like to engage the the audience uh, right off the bat, and, um, uh, and and I'd like to engage the, actually the National Marine uh, uh, and Fisheries uh, Service because um, I mean that's really where a lot of these decisions are made, and and it's where the rubber hits the road. So I'd like to ask uh, Kim Mason, who's an endangered species biologist for NIMS, um, in, in um, when making ESA decisions, how, how do you deal with all the uncertainty that's inherent in evaluating impacts of future climate on uh, species status or habitat. And if you could just wait until you get a, a microphone. 
Thanks. Hi, um, thank you for that. Um, I'm Kim Mason, I work for NOAA Fisheries, as was stated, and I'm a staff biologist there, and I've been working recently on the um, recently listed Indo-Pacific coral species. So we're, we're definitely dealing very um, closely with climate change as an issue in the ESA, and um, as you mentioned, uncertainty plays a huge role in a lot of our decisions. Um, and climate change adds a whole host of additional uncertainty to these things, right? So. Uh, the place where we always start is to use the best available information um, to make our decisions. And then if there are gaps or uncertainties in that information, then the best we can do is to rely on guidance that's been provided by our agency in terms of uh, making consistent assumptions across these types of decisions across the agency um, in terms of what uh, we expect to see in the future uh, from climate change, and then explaining those assumptions and how they affect our decision. Um, we often deal with a lot of uncertainty that's, you know, what we call irreducible. So it, it's related to the fact that we can't see into the future and predict these things with any kind of certainty. And so because we can't wait to see what happens before making a decision, um, we have to just rely on our guidance, make consistent assumptions about things so that we're having a standardized evaluation process across the agency, and then um, just explain as much as possible how those uh, assumptions have weighed into our decision-making process. Thank you. Um, uh, Bruce said or suggested that the ESA is, is probably not an appropriate tool for the regulation of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Does, does everybody agree with that? Does anybody disagree or want to address that issue in, in a, any other wise? Yes. Uh, I'm no authority on climate change. I, I perhaps have a more of a rhetorical question um, for um, maybe Bruce and Eric, and that is that what if we add certainty to the uncertainty and make ESA uh, the tool that perhaps it isn't the right tool, but make it a tool in which we um, allow a listing because of climate change to direct funds to that state or that area where the habitat is for that species, a certainty of funding that goes with that, perhaps coming from climate change credits or uh, uh, you know carbon credits that are purchased. So that, that way, if Alaska gets uh, nailed for the polar bear with, um, with a listing because of climate change, they can be guaranteed they're going to get this large input of funds to address that, and thus they view ESA as a benefit rather than a hindrance to the management of that species. So perhaps a rhetorical question, but I don't know, just a thought. Chris, you got one over here. Hello, um, Laura Merhoff, Center for Biological Diversity. I don't think I'll agree that ESA is not the right tool to look at. Certainly, it may be difficult to use, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at using it as a tool for addressing climate change. Um, so I wouldn't throw that out just as saying it's uh, completely inappropriate. I just want to make sure that you know that's kind of my opinion on that. Um, and I think we do need to look at how the US ESA could help that issue. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, I'd like to respond to the funding question, if I if I sure. may. So, you know, I think that would certainly be helpful, but I, I don't know if um, if everybody here has a, a general idea of how much funds uh, come to the states currently under Section Six. So, I thought maybe we should just discuss that briefly. So, I know there's a lot uh, more money that's directed at species conservation than this particular pot of funds that is divvied up currently to the states as a part of Section 6 of the Act, which talks about that funding mechanism. And believe me, the states are, are, are thankful to get the funds that we do receive under that, that grant, and we certainly want, wouldn't want to see it go away. But an annual request uh, through the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies has always been to increase that dramatically to uh, more, be more equal to the need. And just to give you some ideas for numbers, these are, are fairly ballpark, but in the state I'm in now, Washington, and then the state where I spent 20 some years in Arizona, we had similar annual appropriations of Section 6 funds, and it's around the realm of $250,000. And obviously, this problem is of a much higher magnitude than that. 
and the funding is really insufficient to get at very much. And so you take on one big project that sometimes has a 10 to 20 year lifespan um, and those funds can easily be earmarked for that project you know, for an entire career as a budget de decision maker, as I have been. So I just think it's worth pointing out that, you know, we heard Section 6 mentioned here, and it's great, and, and it's wonderful to see it put to use. Um, but funding is an incredibly important piece of this uh, of this problem statement. And if it could be on the scale um, commensurate with the, with the need, it might make a, a difference. Yeah, Chris. If I could add to that briefly. And I would also suggest that funding through state wildlife grants follow a similar pattern, because if we can identify species or areas, you know, for example, jurisdictions where, you know, there's high potential for listings or lots of listings, there's probably also a lot of other plants that are not yet listed or species that are not let yet listed that meaningful conservation could occur on and state wildlife grants would be the vehicle to do that and also be distributed with that in mind. I also wanted to add on that um, in terms of the Section 6 funding, we do get a little bit more in, in Hawaii um, because of the number of species, but it, you know, we have so many species that it really doesn't make a dent sometimes too. It's just a portion of the funds that go towards the, the um, conservation efforts. So yeah, it would, it, it would be better <laughs> if there was a way to have more secure funding. Well, since I'm the one who hasn't spoken yet, which is a wonderful change from yesterday, uh, a couple of things on the random conversation. And as somebody that also spent 23 years in elected office and was the budget chair most of my run in the legislature, uh, to be really honest, if we had to look to Congress to give us more money to deal with the Endangered Species Act right now, I think they would rather change the Endangered Species Act in the current form of Congress rather than give us more money to make it work. Uh, I just think that's where the reality is. And on Jim's original question, you know, it just seems like <clears throat> sometimes the wrong formulation because we have to deal with climate change. We just have to deal with it. So the question is, is how do we deal with it? And I think uh, the difficult thing, and, and Bruce and Eric were talking about it very clearly, is, and I heard it from somebody that was on a panel yesterday, that somehow the Endangered Species Act should not have you, you know, have the same kind of relevance when you're forced into some of the endangerment because of uh, climate change activities. And somehow we have to deal with the climate change and its impacts. And, and hopefully it's not getting to the point that the Endangered Species Act is the thing that's forcing us to do that. But that's the tough a call. Yes, please. I guess if I had it, I'd put up a big frustration meter and ask you guys to respond to uh, three different things on that meter. One of them is we're asking for response from federal agencies that we've seen just dried up in funding as well to the point where they almost can't react to what you need and certainly can't react in the time and, uh, and space needed. Second, uh, a huge problem that we don't ever even discuss anymore in human population growth and third is, uh, how do you feel about 60% of the presidential candidates online right now denying that you have this problem? There is no such thing as climate change, according to these folks. So uh, I'm just curious about the level of frustration in trying to deal with these issues and uh, meet the demands of your constituency. I have enough trouble without getting into the presidential campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm not going to do that. But I think that your first comment uh, about uh, agencies being funded to deal with it is very relevant. And to use a case study for us, the governor is trying to, and it, it is like the Middle East, uh, deal with water in California in a way of reforming a project. And it depends on the fish agencies coming up with some measure of what the impacts would be in the operations of the proposed project. And right now, 
<clears throat> we're having trouble with at least one agency that basically says we cannot do anything for you in time unless you actually fund the staff uh, to do it. And one of the hardest things here, and this is probably the one place that I'm akin to Alaska uh, uh, on climate change, is we are trying to make it work. And if we can't make ESA work in the context of a $15 billion water project, then it's going to be really hard to defend against anybody that wants to change it. And so we are trying to make it work. And it is an unbelievably complex issue where we have pumps that if they ran in there, as they run now, they reverse stream flows. They suck fish into places where they don't, don't normally go. And we are trying to, Governor, as this 30 mile tunnel project to take the same amount of water in and not suck the fish in, still have the flows to deal with the salt, still deal with the Endangered Species Act in the right way we can't ever get across the finish line and making it work. Meanwhile, Senator Feinstein is joining with certain people, representatives in the San Joaquin Valley, being furious that 500,000 acre feet of water is going by uncaptured and heavy flows after storms because of the turbidity and drawing the fish toward the pumps and other things, which our project, which wouldn't be online for 10 years, would not do. And yet, the federal agencies don't have the funding to give us the operations plan to show us that this works. And if we can't get that by the time various administrations change, then the ESA will not have been made to have worked. And then there will be moves to change it and it will be hard to defend against it. And so it is a very, very difficult thing. And, and we are willing in some cases, as painful as it is, to pay money for staffers to do the work that they should be doing in their statutory responsibility to respond to us, but we're in exactly that situation and trying to work our way through the issue. Kim, let me ask you another uh, uh, kind of practical question. How, how did the service address climate with respect to the uh, uh, coral listing rule? Sure. Um, obviously, that was a huge issue in the coral listing rule. It, it's similar to the polar bear, it was identified as the primary threat to corals. Um, we're all climate change related, ocean warming and ocean acidification. So um, we actually, the guidance that I spoke of that our agency has right now, as far as how to uh, consistently sort of use the climate change predictions was not available yet. So we had to sort of come up with our own justification for the assumptions that we were making. Um, we chose to use uh, the IPCC's fifth assessment report and the RCP 8.5 scenario as our um, the future scenario that we were going to evaluate against the biological and ecological needs of the corals. Um, so that's the one that we chose. We explained our assumption there and we used the time scale that was provided by that scenario as far as now to 2100. and. Um, Again, just consider the biology of each individual species and the ecology um, over that same time frame to the extent possible to determine what their listing status might be uh, in the face of those threats. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions, comments? Yes. Hi, I'm Davi Palmer with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and I want to thank you guys. I thought that was a really great discussion, and you really highlighted all of the the major issues facing us in the future with ESA implementation and climate change. But I was wondering if there's any sort of solutions that people have in mind. I think that Eric did a great job saying that, you know, thinking about climate change and how we prioritize ESA listings, perhaps if climate change is the only threat, that it's a, a lower priority for, uh, to a species that we can do some tangible conservation actions for. Has anyone thought about, um, you know, a different category, like a climate watch list under ESA and, and changes that can be made to, to be more productive in this realm? Um, I'll try to address that. I've actually given a little bit of thought, but under a, a different uh, context, but I think it applies here. And in my mind, I've kind of called it an iconic species uh, funding 
where there are going to be species that um, will always need significant management attention to um, be out there on our landscape and the condor comes to mind. Um, it's going to be a long time indeed before um, that species is, is on the landscape, I think, without significant management oversight and money being spent. And so I, I, you know, I see as a nation, we put money into our monuments, into historical uh, buildings and things that we want to pr protect and preserve. Um, and we value that as a nation. And I just sometimes find myself wondering if we don't need another way to value some of these species that require significant management attention and remove those from the Endangered Species Act in the sense of by putting them into another program, essentially, that's taking care of their needs. And I don't know if that same logic or, or thought process could be applied to climate species, but when there is uh, no tangible management efforts that could be written into a recovery plan that could describe how to get to a delisting or downlisting, if you just can't do that um, for a species that, that would be listed, perhaps it's just another category like the iconic species uh, dream that I have that, that would allow that species to be looked at through another mechanism. And if I can add to that, although I have to say, the uh, thing that always makes me crazy is the iconic species always seem to get the resources. Uh, 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 so whether it's the condor or the sea otter, uh, that in my legislative office we used to refer to as charismatic megafauna, uh, uh, they get the resources and yet the problem is with a whole series of listings that aren't as high profile or don't have as much. And so, so the question is, and yes, I talked about cap and trade in some ways we're investing, how on the landscape basis can you deal with some of these issues and reduce the stressors either before a listing or, or in some cases after a listing? And I mean, one of the big ones for us, you, when you plop 39 million people in the middle of a landscape, it is how to figure out how to deal with the connectivity of certain habitats and as the climate change, how they move. And if they can't move, it limits them and, and sometimes deals with listing issues. And so uh, three or four years ago, we did a statewide assessment uh, of connectivity issues and uh, you know described the critical areas in the state where investments in lasting connectivity had to be made. And in some cases, some of the local governments, I mean, Santa Clara County, which is where the Silicon Valley is, have taken it on and taken sort of the lead that was provided by that and incorporated it into their local general plan so that they can figure out how to do that as things happen. And if you just look, uh, I mean, every a state here, even Hawaii with the, the peaks on the Big Island has an amazing range of altitude and if the climate is changing in a micro way things that might have lived very well at 5,000 feet are going to have to live at 7,000 feet or whatever it is that is is that change and so it's going to require some of this connectivity how can you address that stressor uh, before you're having to address it in the terms of specific listings. And I think that the, it, it, and there are other things that fall in this category, but that was just one for the purposes of discussion that I'd bring up. I'll make it quick. I just, I, I thought I'd make one pitch. Um, obviously what we're talking about is in my presentation anyway, is if climate brings more species into the mix under the endangered species act, it's a prioritization issue and it's a competition for resources, right? Another way to eliminate, eliminate some of that competition is to do a better job with species prior to them needing to be listed. And, um, just to bring it into the conversation, I think what that means is to have a better funding mechanism for our wildlife diversity species, the non-traditional, um, you know, not the, the, the typically harvested species across the state and have the states uh, have the resources necessary to do a better job uh, doing conservation at that earlier step. And it's already been mentioned uh, some yesterday, but the Blue Ribbon Panel through the association has put together recommendations on how to uh, possibly provide a lot of funding to states. And so I'd just throw that out there as well. Uh, state wildlife grants are incredibly important. They go to listed species as well as other species of conservation need. And the more we can tackle on the front end, uh, the more we can spend our limited listed uh, species resources on those that have made it to the Endangered Species Act. Bruce, did 
Joseph? Yes, I'd like to add to this response. Uh, you know, the, the frustration with Alaska's situation is we see these climate change listings as being very different critters, and uh, and we're still treating them in the, in the same same process and mechanism. And whether it's whether it's a, a different category, uh, whether it's a different uh, process and series of steps, or simply a different timeline for the listing procedure that recognizes that this is a different different critter. Uh, it, we think it's time to have that discussion, and, and and instead of having to drop everything and and devote all our resources to something that is not going to decline until 20,090, we should uh, we should focus on you know what we can do for species that are on the edge, in a in a primary primarily and sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, thanks. I would just add that um, from the federal perspective, I totally agree with the panelists as far as taking action before species actually get listed. And as the federal agency, you know, once a species comes to us through a petition or something, we no longer have the luxury of asking ourselves, will the ESA listing help? You know, so um, at that point, it's regardless of what we can do about it, does the species meet the definition of endangered or threatened, period. That's the question we're asking ourselves. So another um, way to approach this is bringing you know the the entities that often are petitioning us into the, into better communication and more conversations as far as whether or not petitions in the ESA are the right tools to sort of get at what they're trying to get at with their petitions you know is their primary goal to bring attention to the, to climate change and to try to get the government to do things at higher levels or is their goal really to assess a certain species and whether or not you know the variety of threats that they're facing is putting them in peril and can we do anything about it uh, my name is David Wilms. I'm with Governor Mead's office in Wyoming. I wanted to ask one question, shifting a little bit to another aspect of the ESA and the climate change discussion, and that's the critical habitat designation component. And I just wanted to ask the panel uh, to you know, just give their thoughts on the uh, on designating critical habitat for a, uh, a a species, you know, in an area where it was never part of the species historic range. It doesn't currently occupy that range, but due to climate change projections and modeling, it's viewed as uh, 50 years, 100 years, whatever it is down the road in the foreseeable future, it might be uh, uh, critical habitat for the species. Uh, and so I just wanted to get the panel's thoughts on that, uh, that aspect of, of climate change in the ESA. I can take a, a little bit of a stab at it. That's especially challenging. It's it's really complicated because now you have to, you know, foresee the future in some place where we're not even the species isn't even present. But uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, some of the, the the species that Maggie talked about and some of the remedies for that, we have a situation with yellow cedar uh, where they can grow. The, the situation with yellow cedar is that with climate change, there's uh, decreased snowpack and increased cold while well, you get freezing events still in areas and the, the, the snowpack protects the roots from damage that kills this yellow cedar. The yellow cedar is prone to living in, in or prefers, I guess, uh, uh, wetter habitats. And so this is what's causing, you know, the some die-offs that occurred since the late 1800s in, uh, in yellow cedar. But they can grow on other sites, you know, so we can create critical habitat and, and maintain it by, by putting cedars and giving them a little competitive advantage in their first years uh, and, and create actually critical habitat for this species if it's necessary. So there's there's a lot of challenges, but a lot of potential for for those kinds of solutions. But the problems are, are quite, quite high, quite large and daunting. Okay, you know we're gonna uh, we're gonna tweak the agenda a little bit uh, following the next panel, which is um, regards the intersection of invasive species and uh, endangered species. We're gonna go straight into uh, uh, breakout sessions uh, over a working lunch, and and so um, and we don't want to give that short shrift at all. So we're gonna take uh, about a about a ten minute uh, break here. But before we do, uh, I want to thank this panel for addressing such a uh,